Um, <clears throat> okay, so like the book of Joshua, the book of Judges is, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned this last time. Wait a second. Can you even, is, is this mic on? Yep. Okay. Wow. So this is a good mic. It was lying on the table and yet picking me up. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, so the book of Judges is also a subject of a great deal of debate among uh, biblical historians or archaeologists, I guess, who, um, you know, there's a whole industry. I mean, it's a, it's a field of biblical archaeology to compare what is written in the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, Samuel, um, to the historical and archaeological data, and then, you know, arguing over what is true and untrue historically or archaeologically true and untrue in the book. And it's, it's a departure from the Torah because the, you know, the, the, the Torah, first of all, much of it, takes place outside the land of Israel. And second, it's so esoteric, and you know, it's the story of one person or one family, and you know, so, so there's, um, what's written in the Torah is seen as a kind of representation of a kind of existence of certain people in the region. Uh, but then once you get to Joshua, there's a real historical story. Uh, uh, there's a, a national history in a location where Israel, uh, where, where ar archaeologists can conduct actual research and see uh, traces of wars, uh, cities, etc. Um, so, anyway, so so the Book of Judges is also uh, kind of a hotly contested, hotly studied in relation to archaeology. Uh, now, the the appearance of this office of the judge after the tribe settlement in Canaan se uh, seems to fit the transition from a tribal migratory social organization or semi-nomadic um, to, to a sedentary, sedentary social, organ social structure. Okay? The, so the, the real tribal leaders were, were the elders. Okay? But in times of need, a judge kind of rises to, to lead a coalition of tribes, or a, a tribe or a coalition of tribes uh, in war. Um, and unlike the elders who are heads of the leading and historic families of the tribe, the judge doesn't derive his... Uh, his authority from a position, from his social position within the tribe, uh, you know, he's not born into a leadership position like an elder is. Okay, he, uh, and and he never bequeaths that leadership role, uh, the military leadership or, or temporal power, to his son. Okay? Um, and then, if you look to the future, to the book that comes after this in Samuel, with the formation of the of the monarchy. Um, then you can see the office of the judge as a transitional system of, uh, as, as a, again, as these Israelites transition from a migratory existence to a sedentary one, this office of the judge emerges and then it becomes uh, permanent, becomes uh, institutionalized in the form, in, in the office of the king. Um, so it, it, and, and, and it's a transition not just between the elders, the, the judges, a transition not just between the elders and the king, but also a transition between having, between the tribe and the nation, between having 12 separate tribes governing themselves independently, like you saw on the map, to having a unified kingdom under a common government. Okay, so in between these two, are these, are these judges who are leading, in many cases, not just their own tribe, but a coalition, a regional coalition of tribes. Um, so, so their leadership is not, is not uh, within the tribe, but over a number of tribes. Um, 
and 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 you see this transitional um, aspect of of the office of the judge, especially in the Gideon story. I, I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure when I said the, the, about, about the king, the first thing that came to your mind was Avimelech. Okay, because after Gideon saves his tribe, the, pe- the, the people ask him to rule over them like a king, <coughs> or as a king, and he says, of course not. Okay? I shall not rule you, my son shall not rule you, God shall rule you. Okay? However, in the very next chapter, his son Avimelech does rule them as a king. Okay? So the, the, the story of Avimelech, including Yotam's uh, alleg- uh, parable or allegory uh, about, about monarchy, uh, in, when, when you look at it at, at this transition anthropologically or, or as a political scientist, you can read that parable by Yotam about the, uh, about the trees putting a king over them uh, as, as reflecting the tribal elders' view of monarchy. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a critique of monarchy, of course. You know, the, the elders lose power when a judge or a king um, rises. Uh, and, and this anti-monarchical view will, uh, will, be, will continue in the book of Samuel. Okay, when the people demand a king from Samuel and, and, and Samuel explains why it's such a terrible idea. And so the, the heart of this critique from, from Deuteronomy, when God talks about, and it, we'll, we'll talk about it later, when we get to Samuel, we'll, we'll go back to Deuteronomy and God's uh, comments on, on, on monarchy. But, but this consistent critique of monarchy from Deuteronomy to the Gideon story to Samuel is that human beings are unfit for kingship because, uh, because of human nature. Okay? Men with power will abuse it. Which is why only God should rule the Israelites as a king. You know, God is the only fitting king for the Israelites. Um, but in any case, so, so, so there's a lot of histor- uh, uh, historians and archaeologists have a lot to say about the inaccuracies of Joshua and, and, and Judges. But overall, in the, like from 30,000 feet up, it, um, it fits the storyline. The, the, this, this political restructuring of leadership in, in, the, in the nation fits the storyline of a tribal society, uh, I'm sorry, of a, uh, of a migratory society becoming sedentary in the, in, in the political ramifications of this. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. Um, we're not comparing the written word to the or the written story to archaeology <coughs> or the archaeology of ancient Israel. So we'll just stick to our literary methods and to the characters that we're introduced to. So, um, so we'll st- start with the Hood, of course. As as you probably. So there's not mu- there's not much to say about Ehud. Okay, it's a it's a simple story, and short. Um, the the uh, telling th- or the the notable thing about Ehud is that you know he's obviously <coughs> he's obviously a lefty, but so if w- w- when you describe a lefty. Uh, usually, you and I, like a lefty pitcher, a lefty tennis player, you think we, we describe them as somebody whose power hand is his, is, is his left hand, or his dexterous hand, his able hand, or, or not able, his uh, talented hand is, is his left hand. So it's a positive way of, of depicting lefties. Um, but the, the Hebrew text presents him not as a man with a strong left hand, 
but as a man whose right hand wasn't working. I don't know if that's how it's translated in England in English as well. I didn't pick up on that. I, I know he uses the knife with the right hand, but yeah, no. But when when, when he's introduced, where is it? Judges three, <coughs> right? Yeah. Judges three. It's it's his first introduction. Uh, after Otniel, verse here, uh, fifteen. The Israelites cried out to God, and up came Ehud ben Gera, a man of Benjamin. The and and, and the man. Uh, so so, what does it say here in English? It says a left-handed man. Ah, okay. So, so again, it's another one of these things that uh, don't get captured in uh, in translation. So, remind me of, of the translation when we get to Deborah or to to Yael and you know killing Sisra because um, a number of translations that I saw just there's a I guess remind me about translation. In any case, what it says in Hebrew is. Uh, again, the, the the word it, it says uh, a man of Benjamin, uh, a man blank right hand, you know, with 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 a blank right hand, and we don't. It it says itel yad yamino, blank hand right, uh, and we don't exactly know what itel means, but it clearly you know for, from from the context here and elsewhere, something is wrong. Okay, it doesn't say a left-handed man, a man with a strong left hand. It says a man with some sort of defect in his right hand. Okay, um, so some sort of deformity or disability or something like that. Um, so again, so he's not described as a as you and I would describe the natural lefty, but some someone who's a lefty because that's all he's got. Okay, so uh, so we're introduced to him right off the bat, as someone who's not impressive, not threatening, because he's handicapped, which probably explains uh, why the king, uh, why King uh, Eglon's guards let him in to have a one-on-one -on -one with the king. Okay, he's, a, he's kind of a weakling. Okay? So the first judge is this, uh, the first major judge, the first of the four major judges. Um, is this weak, handicapped, unimpressive fellow with a little sword. Again, another, he's not a warrior with a big sword, you know, with a little, a little tiny sword that he can hide on his thigh. Um, and if you, if you think of the kind of structure of the book as a whole, the first judge is this 90 pound weakling. The last judge is Samson. Okay? Big, strong, super impressive He-Man tears a line with a, with his bare hands, um, and, and w without getting into the so again, the, there's a lot of debate about whether the structure of the Book of Judges as we have it is the original structure because there, there's some um, textual analysts. Uh, so source critics who point out that actually the stories are mixed up, that A, we don't know it, uh, and B, even if it is true, we're dealing here with the work of the author or the editor who edited it last, and so we're trying to understand the author slash editor's mind. So when, when you look at this structure, which is pretty obvious of, again, the, this small and, and, and weak and crippled um, first judge and that very impressive last judge, physically speaking. Uh, do, do you think it's a, do, do you think that there's a purpose here or, and I'm, 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 it's not a leading question, I, I really am wondering, if you think that there's some sort of significance to this juxtaposition or if it's just, these are just stories. And, and semi-historical stories, you know, that look, there really was a guy like this and therefore we're telling about him. 
Seems like there'd have to be a juxtaposition, I think, just because of the pointing out to the pointing to the physical attributes. Yeah. Um, but what 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 would it what mean? Would it be? Yeah. What would the my first be? <laughs> my first inclination is that uh, because uh, Hood is seems more successful than Samson. In some respect, oh, like he's and, starting things, yeah. like he's Samson's ending thing. Well, um, it, it, it's not just that. It's so um, there's a if if you look at, I, I think I wrote this about the land was was at peace for X years. If you look at um, verse twenty nine, twenty nine thirty. Okay, it, it you know this is the war. Um, they they defeat Moab that day and with, with you know killing everyone uh, in sight. Moab the Moabites surrender, and the land was quiet for eighty years. Usually, the land is quiet for most of the judges. The land is quiet for forty years. In one case, I think it's twenty years. I forget which judge it is. Maybe maybe Iftah, uh, Jephthah, but uh, I'm not sure. But with uh, Samson this sentence is not mentioned at all, okay? because there was no war against the Philistines. Okay? And so, look, there, there's a, when we get to Samson, there's, uh, we'll discuss this at great length. Uh, Samson is univ almost universally understood as the, the worst of the judges, the most uh, debased of the judges, the least worthy of the judges, and and it's reflected in the fact that he didn't lead the nation, he didn't liberate the nation, uh, and therefore the the land was not at peace at the end of his reign. Whereas um, Ehud, by this standard of how many years the land was at peace, was the most successful one. Okay, so. Uh, so, so this juxtaposition feeds into that, uh, that, that understanding of, of, of Samson. The, the under what, what I told you about Samson is a whole understanding of, of the book of Judges. That it's a book about degeneration, decline, decline yeah. Uh, and therefore, it starts with kind of this humble figure, this, this nebesh, uh, Ehud, who is actually the most successful one, and there's a generational decline in the quality of leadership, ending with Samson, who is terrible, um, and 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 doesn't do anything. So that's that's one. You know, what, what, what you pointed to that he seems very successful, much more successful than Samson. Your um, kind of hitting uh, a narrative about the Book of Judges that that. That many you know, uh, I forget what the um, uh, th there's a Hebrew saying that you are I guess th th that you th you think great like great minds think great minds think alike so so like many other great uh, observers you, you observe this but uh, but anything else so you're right that that's one interpretation of the book that lends itself here to this that benefits from this juxtaposition. position. So the, um, it would seem to indicate that strength is very, uh, doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to this position. But then it makes me second, because you compare that to a figure like David, and that doesn't seem to, if the judge is like the king, and David is a great warrior king, yeah. he stands in contrast to the hood, in some ways more like Ehud, some ways more like Samson. Right. It, it, it seems that actually Ehud and Samson um, are paragons of leadership. Kind of, I, I didn't think of it, but you're right, like, like David. Okay, so that, that even though they're an odd couple, you know, Ehud and, and, Sam, you know, Ehud and Samson physically, um, <coughs> they both stand for a certain kind of Gaul, or, or, or um, you know, b b between them are Barak, Gideon, and 
Iftah, Jephthah, uh, all of whom are obviously and repeatedly reluctant to lead their people to war. Okay, they had to be pushed and prodded to do it. Okay, Barak is prodded by, by Deborah, Gideon by God, Iftah by the elders. Uh, but, but Barak has to be shamed into it. Uh, Gideon has to be pressed and, and convinced repeatedly by God. God is almost begging him, or, or not begging, but entreating him. Uh, and Iftah has to be bribed by, by the tribe elder, el, elder, elders. Um, but Ehud and Samson, even though they're very different, they're both uh, fearless and they both volunteer for service. Okay, they're not appointed to go, uh, to, to, to go do what they do by, by, by the elders, like, like Yiftach, or by God, like Gideon and Barak. Okay, they just go on their own initiative. They, they, they appoint themselves to do, to, to do the good work. Okay? Uh, so in that respect, what the... So the, the first observation you made about the juxtaposition goes along with the narrative of judges as a story of decline. Great judge at the beginning, crappy judge at the end, and in the middle is a declining middle. Uh, this leadership, the, 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 this observation about the juxtaposition points to a kind of um, decline and, and or, or, or two paragons of leadership, of, of uh, two positive models uh, start to finish, and then in the middle, a lesser version. What, what, what the three middle judges share is timidity or... or I guess timidity in, in Barak and Gideon and a lack of devotion to the nation in Iftah. Okay, because they, they're not volunteering for service. They're not self-sacrificing. Or, or they don't have that leadership impulse. Okay? Little Ehud and Big Samson are the opposite. They're fearless. They, want to, they, they lead impulsively or naturally. And, and, they, and they're self-sacrificing. Okay, so Ehud wasn't killed on the job like Samson, but he did go into a suicide mission. Okay, um, okay so I, I, I don't have much to say beyond that about Ehud. I don't know if you had any problems with the text or any, any observation. Oh, not yet. Okay. Um, okay. So let's move uh, move to to Deborah, which is which is a story that's a bit more elaborate. Um, actually, that's another thing I didn't um, didn't think of it when you, as we're now thinking of the stories, the the structure of of, of judges, the stories get more and more elaborate. You know, when you move from one judge, you know, so Ehud is a short and simple story. Deborah's story is slightly longer and has more scenes in it, uh, but still pretty short and basic. The Gideon story is longer with more episodes and more scenes, including a very long epilogue about his son, about Avimelech's uh, reign after him. The Iftah story is short, relatively. I mean, n not as short as Deborah's, but you know, shorter than, than Gideon, but it's uh, but it's got a lot in it. has many scenes, many layers, and a very complicated character with comp complicated relationships with, with the Israelites and, and um, with the authorities. And then Samson, the last judge, has the longest story, and the mo it, it's the most complete story from a literary perspective. It's, it's a full biography from birth to death with many scenes and episodes and, and character developments, or uh, character development. Uh, it, it has a, a real drama dramatic arc, like a full story, like a full literary creation. Um, so I, I, look, I, I don't know what to make of, of, of it, but it does look like the author is doing more with the characters as the book progresses. So again, I, 
I don't know what the significance of it, but uh, then again, I didn't even think of it till now. So maybe I'll have some ideas later on. Um, so Deborah, so the story, the story of this of this war is told twice. Once by the biblical author, and then again retold by Deborah herself in her own words in what's known as the Song of Deborah, okay, where she narrates the events in poetic form. Uh, and again, depending on the... Some translations uh, into English retain the... Um, kind of the, the, the brief sentences and, and, and poetic repetitions that, that are there in Hebrew and others uh, are more prosaic. So I, I, I don't know which ones, uh, which, how, how your translation approached it. Uh, but in any case, but the fir- in, in Hebrew, the first narration by the author is prosaic and Deborah's is a real poem. Um, and these accounts are a bit different. Okay, so, for example, in the song of in the song of Deborah, we're told that the Canaanite chariots couldn't operate because the land was wet and muddy. So, uh, so commentators kind of point to the to point to that as the because the the Israelite victory in the first narration seems miraculous. You know, how could these foot soldiers? a smaller number, defeat these Canaanite chariots. But the Song of Deborah comes in and explains, oh, now we understand it. Okay, it's be, that, that's the secret of the Israelite foot soldiers' surprising victory. So, again, perhaps, but, you know, obviously we don't know. <clears throat> and um, um, so, so, since we don't know, and since it's not material to our kind of investigation, there's no point in parsing the history of, of the battle. Um, instead, I want to focus on, on the characters. Now, the this, this story is unique in the Bible in that it has strong female characters. Okay? The, the, the most dominant female, the, the, the most dominant, the most dominant characters are Deborah and Yael, and you can add to that Sisra's mother, who is kind of very evocative, a uh, very strong presence in the story as a whole, even though she's just a, a metaphor. Uh, not a metaphor, but a, uh, a poetic creation in, in Deborah's mouth. Um, in any case, so the, the, so the female characters are very strong, whereas the male characters, Barak and Sisra, are receding. You know, they're, they're dependent characters in, in terms of their liter, literary function. Okay, so, so you can see in the, in the first part of the story, Deborah is the lead character and Barak is the trailing character. Okay, so she acts. She hectors him. She hectors the tribes. Um, she leads, whereas he responds, he follows her. And then in the second part of the story, in Sisra's story, Yael is the leading character, and Sisra is the, is a trailing character. She acts, he is acted upon. And then when you move to the second account, the, the, the retelling in the Song of Deborah, uh, again, there are three active characters, and that is Deborah, Yael, and, and Sisra's mother. Okay, the male characters are again, they're, they're, they're passive, they're acted upon, or, or, or their, their, their role is diminished compared to, you know, Barak's role in Deborah's song is diminished compared to his role in the first telling of the story. So it, it's such a, you know, the, the having a story that is so female dominated and the fact that it's so consistent in, in all phases of the Deborah chapters, it clearly stands out okay, in, in 
in the Bible, certainly, and in ancient literature. Okay. So, so clearly it was something that the author was aware that he was doing. Okay. So what, what do you think it was? What, what's, the, what's the point? You know, what, what's the author trying to, to say, to convey, to, 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 to illustrate, or to do by having such strong female leads? Um, and and, and but just before you, even if it's true, okay, even if it's historically true that Yael was this prophetess who had this relationship with Barak, and that Yael, a woman, killed Sisra, um, you don't have to harp. You know, if if the author didn't want to harp on it, he didn't have to harp on it. He could limit the the, the role of Deborah. And highlight what Barak did do. I mean, obviously, Barak did do various things, and you could, uh, and, and you and you wouldn't have to tell the whole story in great detail of Sisra's death if you didn't want to highlight the woman's role in it. So, what, what do you think? It's the purpose is. Uh, my first guess would be something like uh, if who is. Uh, uh, handicapped, it seems to uh, continue with an emphasis that the physical attributes aren't the most important mm. in this situation. Like, it's uh, the yeah, yeah. courage and uh, I guess being able to war game things out. Yeah, yeah, kind of gumption and and sp spirit, not not in the sense of spirituality, but fighting spirit. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it certainly, um, so often, I mean, I, I know if often, but, but this story has been, or sometimes is used to highlight, or, or to, to, to find in the Bible a pro-female voice, pro-female uh, attitude in this ancient culture, ancient book. I think we can safely uh, dismiss that that idea. You know, the biblical author was not a feminist, okay, and w women's empower empowerment was not a standard goal for ancient people or ancient literature. Okay, so if you see female leads, there's a message that is not the same as what you'd find in modern literature, which is feminist or at least more. Um, uh, appreciative of, of women's roles in society or, or, or encourages a different role for women in society. Um, so, so you're right, it could be a continuation of, of highlighting that, again, strength is not, physical strength is not that important, which if we extend that further to Gideon, you can, you, you can see this theme continuing because here he collects, I forget, I think 3,000, uh, 30,000, and God cuts it down to 3,000 and then to 300. You don't need a large army to, to be successful. Okay? You don't need to be a, a he-man like Samson to kill the, uh, the king of Moab. And the same here. So, uh, so that's a good point. And, and, and one that kind of attaches to the previous and, and following story. I saw it differently, though. Uh, so I, I, it's a good point, and I agree with it. But I also agree with myself uh, in that I, 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 I see it simply because I've, I've read commentaries uh, that, that make sense to me in this respect, and, and, and look at other, um, other instances in ancient literature with female leads and, and claim to see this at play, and that is that a strong female lead is a rebuke to men. Okay, that, that, that highlighting Deborah's leadership role is a way of shaming Barak for failing to, to live up to his expected role. And we're, we're told this by Deborah herself. Deborah uh, shames Barak in it, or chastises Barak for not 
not performing his role and having her, requiring her to step up to play his role. Okay, so, so that the, the author is shaming Barak for failing to take the initiative and take the lead for Israel and for God. Um, and by the same token with Sisra, okay, that, that highlighting Yael as the, as the killer, <clears throat> it shames and belittles and makes sport of the mighty Sisra uh, because he was slain by a woman. Okay? And you can see this, again, this is, not sim- this is not simply a speculation based on how anthropologists view ancient society as very masculine and uh, kind of um, th- their views on women. Okay? Uh, this observation follows our, our method of knowing what we know based only on what the biblical text tells us openly and plainly. It's called the pshat, the, the, the plain reading of the text. Um, so, so if you look at uh, Judges, uh, at, at chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, 4, 6 through 9, okay, the, the, uh, the conversation between her and, and Barak. Okay, so you can see here that, uh, that, that we, the readers, are told what we should think about Barak. Okay, she, she, she's, De- Deborah says that Barak is unworthy of the glory of a victory because he looks to her to lead him. Okay, so she says that the glory for his victory would go to a woman. Okay, so it's not the, the, these... Uh, commentators are not projecting something onto the text because they're extrapolating something from what we know about ancient society. They're just reading the text. Deborah tells us, de- tells us by telling um, Barak, you know, w- what it says here in these uh, verses. And then if you jump to um, Judges 9, this is the story of, uh, of Imelech. Judges 9 at the very end, uh, verses 52, yeah, 52 to 54, yeah, actually, why don't you read it, See, I, I want to see how the translation is. As Avimelech uh, pressed forward to the tower and attacked it, he approached the door of the tower to set fire on it, uh, but a woman dropped an upper millstone on Avimelech's head and cracked his skull. And? He immediately, cried. Uh-huh. he immediately cried out to his attendant, his arms bearer, draw your dagger and finish me off, that they may not say of me, a woman killed him. And he died. Okay. Okay, so, um, and, and, and so, the, the, so, so on the one hand, we have Deborah telling Barak, your glory will go to a woman. And then in the second story of the dominant woman, with Sisra being killed by a woman, we know, again, not from anthropology or theorizing, we know from the text, from the Avimelech story, that being killed by a woman clearly uh, mocks Sisra. It shames him. Because Avimelech, again, as we just read, um, Avimelech knew, and ancient readers knew, there was a terrible dishonor for a man to be killed by a woman. Okay, so, so Avimelech, like, uh, here Avimelech hoped to undo this shame um, you know, with, with his dying breath. You know, he tried to undo it. You, know, you kill me so that nobody could say that, uh, that, that a woman killed me. But then the biblical author undoes it. Okay, so even though Avimelech was killed by his arms bearer, the biblical author reveals his shame to the readers and to future generations. Okay, don't be fooled. He was actually killed by a woman. What a loser. Okay, so it's the same thing here in our story with uh, Sisra. It, 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 um, so, so if that is the case, 
okay? Uh, you know, the, 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 then what's the story about? Okay, because again, we need to be aware that we're, we're reading a highly uncommon story here. A story with two leading ladies in which the men are completely overshadowed. Okay, all the other female leads in the Bible have a role because of their connection to the male lead. Eve and Adam. Esther and and Mordecai. Rebecca is tied to Isaac. Abigail is, is, is a dominant character because she's tied to David, because of her connection to David. Um, Michal maybe, uh, she's not a dominant character, but also she's there because she's connected to David or to Saul. Um, but here we have a story in which there are two female leads independent of male characters who drive, dr drive the storyline. Okay, the, um, if you think of it, Deborah doesn't have a husband at all. And Yael's husband is, you know, we just know that he exists, but he doesn't, you know, he has no role in the story at all. She drives her own story, her, her own plot development. Okay, the only other story like this in the, in, um, in the Bible is the book of Ruth, which, which is sui generis. Okay, it's a... It really is a special case, which we'll discuss when we when we when we read it. Um, in any case, so just keep in mind that this is a really rare story, certainly in the Bible and in ancient literature. So, um, so the author is presenting his audience with a noticeably odd story. Again, and, and it was in fact more odd for them than it is for us, because you and I have read stories, seen TV shows with female leads. Okay, for them, this was, you know, a, a story with female leads and no male leads. Um, was an eye, it was kind of uh, not shocking. I don't want to overdo it, but it it, it stood out. Okay, so um, so it's reasonable to assume that the audience drew some kind of message from this eye-catching story. Okay, a, a message that the author wanted them to pick up by writing the story in this particular way. Okay, and, and so, um, so, look, so if this is indeed a story about wimpy, if, 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 the, if that takeaway message by the author to the audience was that this is a story about wimpy Israelite men, who don't confront their oppressors, you know, don't lead, don't fight, then uh, what's the, what's the, per what, what's that for? Why, why does the author want to tell this story to the Israelites who are reading this book? And again, they're reading this book after, you know, it, it, the story, the, the, the book of Judges was written at some time after the book of Judges. After the period of the judges, um, it would have to be uh, to uh, heighten the war-like mentality. I suppose that uh, you need to be on your guard. You need to fight in order to that that kind of narrative. You need to fight in order to preserve, in order to get by. Fighting's part of right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, part of the way of life. Part it, it's it's part of the way of life. Part of the uh, not Ever duty, but, but part of the uh, it, you know to keep this land that you've been given, you have to fight. Okay, it's it's it. Ever since yeah. Egypt, it would uh, seem to go against the, the mentality in Egypt too. You keep you're not slaves. You have to. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Actually, you're right. It's kind of it goes with the kind of a message that they were giving given in the desert repeatedly. But if you look at um, so this is in the in the Song of Deborah. Uh, if you look at so, uh, chapter five, verses uh, 
Yeah, verses 14 to to 16 to 18. Okay. okay. So again, we, we need readers because it's but but basically Deborah is praising the, 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 the tribes who came to fight with her, with, with, with Barak. Okay. See, Issachar, Zvulun, came to fight, and then in uh, 16, yeah, 16 and 17, she is... Ma, uh, she shames. She asks the tribes who didn't come and join them, join the fight, "Why did you sit out?" Okay, she's shaming them for for not joining the fight, just as she shamed Barak for not leading the nation to war. Okay, so the the um, the, the as as you said, the Book of Judges tells the story of how the, the, the like in the email I sent you. The, there's a a narrative in the book of Judges about how the Israelites after conquering the land under Joshua lose their, their trust in God their, their faith that God will provide and they start following because they, they lose trust in God they seek protection and, and they serve other gods Canaanite gods uh, they lose their way they lose their strength they lose their fighting spirit and therefore, they lose their, their freedom. Okay, they, they, they lose their faith in God. They become fearful, follow uh, foreign gods. They lose the, the, their strength and fighting spirit is sapped. And that's why their neighbors invade them, kill them, plunder them, tax them, and rule them. Okay, so the, so the arc of the story in this book leads from the death of Joshua, you know, the... Um, the, the, the strong warrior chief. All the way, so the, the book starts with the death of, of, of Joshua and it ends with Samson, another strong warrior who takes the war to the enemy. Okay. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it, but when, when Samson is conceived, the angel of God tells his mother that this boy will start the deliverance of Israel, of the Israelites. And indeed, if you look, you know, to the next, you know, um, you know, following Samson, the next leader is, uh, the, the next leader that comes along is Saul, who starts, again, who continues with that fighting spirit. He, he takes the war to, to Israel's various oppressors, defeats them all, and then King David finishes the job and liberates the Jews completely and, and subdues all the, the enemies around them. Okay. And in between, in, in between Joshua and Samson, these two fighters, okay, is this descent to idolatry and weakness and defeat at the hands of, of, of foreigners. And, and the leaders that come forth in this period are, are not the cream of the crop. Okay, so, so, so why does it fall to little Ehud, handicapped Ehud, to lead the fight? Okay, why aren't the strong, able-bodied leaders of the tribes riling their men to fight this fight? And why does Barak have to be prodded and hectored by a woman to liberate his people. Okay, why, why doesn't, you know, Barak says that he doesn't trust that God is with him. Okay, he, you know, he needs her to be in his camp to have, you know, he has faith that God will provide only if she's there with him, like, like a child who needs his mother. Okay, and, and Gideon, why, why does Gideon have to be pushed and begged and cajoled by God himself to go to war, um, to, 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 to a war of liberation. Okay? And, then, and then Iftach. Okay? Why does it fall to Iftach, the outsider, 
you know, a, a man who was vomited out of his own tribe to lead that tribe to war. Again, this is a man who lived on, on the outskirts of, of Israel. You know, he, he had no lineage, you know, the son of a whore. Uh, kicked out of his tribe, lives, lives at the edge of society as some sort of, I don't know, gang leader of some sort. Why, why does it fall to him to lead the tribe? He's not a leader of the tribe. Why aren't the leading families of the tribe, of Menashe, of his tribe, uh, leading the fight to liberate their own people? Okay, so, so do you see what I mean? That the, 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 the leaders who lead the Israelites to war are these marginal people, marginal types. Okay, this handicapped man, a woman, a timid man who doesn't want the job and has to be compelled to do it, and, and an outcast from society. Okay, so this, this book is a book, again, if, if, if there's a message here, which I, I think when you kind of tie all these things together, the author conveys a certain message with his choice of characters and how they're presented and everything else um, to tell, to convey something to the audience. And that is that this is a book about the Israelites' weakness after Joshua and before Saul, before King Saul. It's a book about the leading families of the tribes not leading. Okay? Uh, not in the fight against idolatry and not in the fight against the oppressors. Okay, and, and um, like it, it's going to be two weeks until we, we, we get to, to uh, Samson and even more uh, till, till we get to Saul. But I want you to keep in mind this uh, or keep an eye on this. Again, this critique of the traditional leadership leaders of the society as a as a as a theme and as a kind of lesson to the audience uh, about you know what, what what to learn from all of this okay and okay so, so keep it in mind for for the samson story and especially for the post samson story because after samson you know at, at the very tail end of, of uh judges there's these two really bizarre episodes with the Micah's statue and the concubine at, uh, at Giva, which we mentioned last time. And in both of the, well, okay, so, so just keep an eye on that. I, I don't want to mix things here, but the, the, the swing back towards that fighting spirit that we see in Samson and definitely in Saul, there seems to be something there in those last two bizarre stories that, 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 where, where that theme connects. Yeah, because if you can, just keep it in mind. Um, now, before we get to Gideon, I want to talk about uh, Sisra's mother. This is in Deborah's song in chapter 5. Um, so, <clears throat> um, oh, actually, we need to talk about Yael first. Okay, we have um, Sisra's mother first, and then we'll, we'll go to, to Yael. Um, so Deborah's depiction of Sisra's mother you know, waiting at the window for her son to, to return is, has become iconic in biblical commentary and, and, and in literature in general. Um, and it's sometimes presented as a poignant and compassionate um, uh, verse. Or, you know, that th these verses about Sisra's mother are... are are compassionate in the sense that it, it shows a woman being able to feel and understand the anxiety of another woman, even if this other woman is from the enemy camp, okay, a, a soldier's mother in this case. Um, I've, I've, I've seen it as a, used as a, as a way to encourage empathy on our part for, the, for our enemies. And I want to ask you what, you, what, what, what you think of this. What do you think of this scene? Which verse is it? 28 through 30? 28 That's 30. what I have. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you think of this understanding of these verses? Because it is, look, it, it's, it's very... Um, 
it's very intimate mm. you know about especially verse uh, 30 must be okay but okay so, so what do you think of this um, again the, this this understanding of, of, of these verses as a a connection between people across enemy lines and specific or, or maybe even specifically between women because they they can em- sympathize with the others situation so it could also be uh, um, uh, chastising the enemy men in that uh, when they don't do their job the women suffer and grieve and it's the men who allow it to happen by not fighting better or yeah yeah no that, that, that well that, but, but but do you think that is the case or um do, do you side more with what you just said or with what i i suggested but it's i don't like do, do you see it as a as a as a as a mocking uh verse or verses or as a as an empathetic statement again look we, we, I don't know it, it, it's, not, it's not that we you know we, we can't uh, well I mean I think we can know but it's you know we're, we're trying to read the mind of somebody else so it's obviously going to be speculative so in my English translation verse 28 ends with or in verse 20 it says through the window peered Sarah's mother behind the lattice she whined and that word whine in English doesn't is doesn't yeah, seem empathetic uh, as it does seem mocking. Yeah, uh, so I, I would have it as weeped, w- okay. uh, wept, wept, wept. Okay. And, and, and so, uh, so how does it continue? Uh, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why so late the clatter of his wheels? The wisest of her ladies gave answer. She too replies to herself. They must be dividing the spoil they have found, a damsel or two for each man. Uh, spoil of dyed clothes for Cisra or Cisra, uh, spoil of embroidered clothes, a couple of embroidered clothes, or cloths, uh, round every neck as spoil. Yeah. So, guys, they they, they must be that, that her ladies in waiting are calming her down. It must be that they're dividing the spoils between them, and she herself comes to tell herself, "Yes, yes, he's probably late because they, they're dividing the spoils. That's why he's not coming home to me." Yeah. So. Um, again, I, I, I can see it, especially for modern readers, that they would see this as a sympathetic uh, connection to this victim of, of, of war on the other side of the battlefield. Uh, however, I don't think it fits the, uh, I, don't think it, I don't think it fits the tone of the Bible and definitely not the tone of this story. Yeah, I'm much more sympathetic to your uh, reading of it. Uh, because, look, th- the Bible is not a touchy-feely book. Okay? And it was not written for a touchy-feely society. Okay? And it certainly was, was not a feminist society or, or, or a, a society that uh, highlighted feminine qualities or what we today think of as feminine qualities. Um, the Israelites, like all their neighbors, were a patriarchal society living in harsh conditions, living in a rough neighborhood with all the harsh uh, realities that that entails. Uh, But on top of this, on top of the kind of anthropology or sociology of of ancient Israel, um, just looking at this story, this whole story mocks Sisra. The biblical narrator uh, makes sure that we understand that that he is mocking him and that we should that, that we should be laughing at him uh, or, or smirking about him um, by you know, um, the, the author makes sure that, that this is our response by presenting Sisra 
as a weak child in Yael's tent, you know, by having him killed by a woman. And then Deborah mocks him further by harping on that endlessly, on the fact that a woman killed him. And she then mocks the mighty Sisra uh, further by painting a picture of his mother fretting about her son who's already dead and will never come home. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about Sisra's death at, at, at the hands of Yael. Um, this story smolders with sex. And I don't know how, depending on your translation, I don't know if you notice this, because many translations, um, many translators of the Bible are more uh, puritanical or more uh, chaste, more chaste than the Bible itself. So um, many translations have this notion of uh, of the Bible or, or, or work at presenting the, the Bible as a book for chaste religious people. Okay? And, and, and they tone down the, the sex or the violence uh, or, or they tone down the, if, if they don't tone down the actual events, at least the language. Uh, the nice, the, the, the benefit of, of, of knowing Hebrew is that because the the because this text itself had become holy about I don't know two thousand years ago, Jews were never allowed to alter it or tone it down or edit it, uh, which means that ever since this book was canonized, you know, it was kind of okay, when it was set in its current form about two thousand years ago or so. Um, then that's it. You know, the Hebrew version from that time on has been unchanged and, and couldn't be cleaned up. Even, even if the people, even if the rabbis and parents and teachers were uncomfortable with the sex and the violence and, 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 and who knows what other descriptions, because it became, because the, the pages themselves, the, the, the words became holy, it couldn't be cleaned up in, a, in the way that the text has been cleaned up by uh, later translations into foreign languages, reflecting the various uh, aesthetic and, and, and moral and, and even theological uh, understanding of those, la- of, of those translators. So, um, but even in English, I'm sure you kind of got the gist you know, like she, at the tent, you know, she gives him this come hither look when he comes to the tent. She takes him into her tent, which is already suggestive. They're alone. She's a married woman, alone with a strange man, uh, in her tent, not seen by others. She covers him. You know, the, I don't know if it says that in, in your translation, but she covers him twice. And then he falls asleep. Okay, and, and, and the readers can only imagine what happened between the time she feeds him and the time uh, slept, uh, asleep overtook him. And after it's all over, according to Deborah's account, actually, how, how do you have it in, 20, in, in uh, 5, verse 20, 26? Uh, 26, 27. Her left hand reached for the tent pin, uh, her right for the workers or the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, or Sisera crushed his head, smashed and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, lay outstretched. I knew. At her, oh, go ahead. At her feet he sank, uh, lay still. Where he sank, there he lay destroyed. Okay, so it's exactly, it's, again, it's a more chaste. Uh, so, um, the the, the the Hebrew text has her has Sisra falling dead not at her feet, like a lot of translations have it, but between her legs. 
Okay, so again, so I, I, again, I, I we, we can follow the translation verse by verse, but uh, it, it's just that I've seen it before. Again, I don't know which translation I'm using, but um, there's this tendency of of the translators to look. It's just a very sexy story, okay, and and you can't erase it, but you can tone it down, okay. You don't have to. It, it's just you can't say it in church. He fell between. He fell dead between her legs. It's scandalous, okay. So, um, in any case, so uh, again, I, I want you to uh, to notice here how Yael is active and Sisra is reactive. Okay, she's the leading figure. He's the trailing or, or dependent character. She's, she acts and he's acted upon. So she initiates contact with him at the tent, at, at the edge of the tent. Uh, she, invites, she invites him to enter her tent, which he then does. He, he uh, complies. Okay? She gives him instructions and he complies. She tells him, don't be afraid. He's a mighty general. Okay? Don't be afraid. And you know she brings him in. Uh, she covers him with a blanket, which is uh, apparently I, don't know, I, I read about that, that that covering is kind of code for some sort of sexual act. Not sure. Um, uh, she gives him milk. Milk. Again, it, it infantilizes him. The, 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 this whole description. Um, he asks her to please hide him and protect him. The man asks the woman to protect him. Again, like a child asks his mother. Okay, so the, the, this, this mighty general is like a baby or a child with Yael providing him shelter, sleep, milk, and, or food, milk, and, and protection. Okay. Uh, so, so the story is obviously emasculating this great general who abused and came to destroy the Israelites. Okay. And in fact, and again, I don't know if this comes across in the translation, there's, I, I, it seems to me that there's, again, if, since there's this constant mockery here um, of, of, of Sisra, I think there's a joke at his expense in chapter four, this is in the narrator's version of the story, uh, verse, 20. Yeah. Okay, so she is in, in 19. And you tell me how you have it here in, in yours. Uh, in 19, he, he tells her, um, g give me some water, please, uh, because I'm thirsty. And she, uh, she, she, she gives him milk and covers him. And then what, what do you have in 20? Uh, he said to her, stand at the entrance of the tent if anybody comes and asks ah! you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> if, if there is anybody here, say no. It's, it really is a crime. Um, so what, what, it, uh, what it says here in, in, in Hebrew is, where is it? 20. He told her, where is it? Okay, he told her, stand at the uh, opening of the gate and if, uh, if anyone comes and asks you, is there a man here, say no. Okay? Not, is, is there anyone here? Is there a man here? Okay. So, uh, so we, you know, the, the author and the audience, know that, uh, that Sisra is unwittingly telling the truth. Okay? There is no man in the tent. Not a real man, that is. Okay, so again, it, it, yeah, man, makes sense. It, it, um, it seems to me that we're, th throughout the story, we're at, we're, we're, it, it's a comical story. Not, not comical, but it's a, it's, a, it's a mocking story of the enemy. And, and uh, again, it's... it's <laughs> To, to me, it seems like a like a laugh line. Okay, but um, okay, missed. Um, so look, so 
so we need to move on. But uh, but before we do, why does the El do this? Why does she kill Sisra? You know, she's not an Israelite, and her people, the Canaanites, the the Canaanites, the the or Kenites, uh, are were actually allies of the Canaanites. Okay, so why does she kill Sisra? She's trying to uh, come down on the winning side. Like if she's an enemy of my enemy is perhaps right. my friend. That, that's, so Ye Yael is, pre is presented as uh, kind of like, is, is sometimes presented as l l like these uh, Gentiles in the Holocaust who hid Jews in their homes and everything else. And then they, they get um, recognized by the state of Israel for being uh, these, these um, kind of, Saints of the of, of, of the gen, of the Gentiles of the of the nations, um, because they came to the aid of Israel even though they didn't have to. My sense is exactly like you say that that um, she lives there. She saw what happened. The Israelites just won the war. Barak is sweeping through the battlefield, killing enemy soldiers right and left. Okay, so especially as an ally, as as, as a member of her people who are allies of the Canaanites, Yael will want to show the victors that she's with them and not with her now former allies, who are the Israelites' oppressors and enemies. Yes, I'm, I agree. Um, okay, so to Gideon. So I, um, chapter 6. So I asked you to contemplate the contrast between what the prophet tells the Israelites in this is chapter 6 in verses uh, 6 through 10 6 through 10 and what Gideon tells the angel in 613 The, um, the, uh, the, the have the wondrous deeds seems to emphasize in 13. And it what, 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 what is it? Okay, actually, um, can, can you actually could, could you read the because uh, it, it well, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Could you read to me what you have in English uh, for, for, for what the prophet says and then what, what Gideon says? So uh, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites who said to them, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and freed you from the house of bondage. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I, the Lord, am your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Uh, but you did not obey me. Okay, good. And then, Okay, that's the same as, as I have it. And then the angel came uh, da, 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 and, uh, and, and um, comes to, to Gideon. Then Gideon said to him, uh, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this befallen us? Where are all his wondrous deeds about which our fathers told us, saying, Truly the Lord brought us out from Egypt. Now the Lord has abandoned us and delivered us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and okay, said... Yeah. Okay, good, good, so, so far. Okay, so what, what is the uh, contrast between what God, through the prophet, is telling the Israelites and what Gideon, in response, is telling God, or the angel of God? Uh, God uh, said, I've done all these things things in the past, do as I tell you kind of thing, and Gideon saying, well, I haven't seen these wondrous deeds. Right, and, and yeah, uh, absolutely, but, but God says more. You know? God says, I've done all these things and told you uh, to, do, uh, to, to do this, and you, dis and you disobeyed me. Okay? Mm -hmm. You left me. You left me. Okay? So the, the prophet says that, uh, that basically that God that the Israelites are in their condition because they abandoned him. Okay, God 
left the Israelites to their to their fate because they abandoned him. Whereas Gideon says the opposite, as you, as you pointed out. Gideon Where's says, Gideon? we abandoned God because God abandoned, God abandoned us. Okay, we've heard of long ago miracles. Okay, so kind of what have we done for me lately? Okay, we've heard that God has done all these things for our fathers and ancestors. But we haven't seen a miracle and God hasn't saved us in a long time. Okay? We're on our own here. Okay? So we, we haven't seen evidence that God... We, we don't see evidence that God is with us. Okay? So our understanding is that God has left us. Okay? So is this... <coughs> is, this uh, is this blasphemy or is this a, just a, a correct observation? What seems to be a repeating theme that um, anyone who's asked to do something by the biblical God who hasn't wants miracles, wants proof um, right. that they're gonna that they're not crazy, right? And that they're they can trust in this. Yeah. No, you're look as we've talked endlessly about about Abraham, okay, the most faithful faithful man in the Bible. Um, he kept doubting. He kept wondering is this really God or am I or am I seeing thing until he got his, his miracle okay Pharaoh Jacob Moses the Israelites in the desert okay and we know in this case uh, we know it's you know that Gideon isn't committing some sort of terrible sin because God doesn't strike him dead or, or God doesn't ignore him God actually relents God listens to him and, and responds. Yeah, um, God will provide him with miracles, and God will save the nation uh, with with only three hundred men. Okay, so um, so like when we keep coming coming back to this issue, you know, from Abraham to Pharaoh to Moses, etc., um, that. For that audience, 3,000 years ago, and for our audience today, believing in a good and trustworthy God is a real leap of faith. Yeah? Because it goes against everything your senses tell you. Okay? Your eyes and ears show you daily that you are subject to capricious and cruel forces in the world seemingly capricious and cruel gods or no god at all just random chance okay uh so and, and you know you turn on the tv you see earthquakes and droughts and floods and collapsed buildings and fires war violence crime uh, you know uh, that show cheaters uh husbands cheating, cheating on their wives mothers killing their children etc um so so unless you live under a rock, unless you're not aware of what's going on in the world, if you're just living in your four walls, uh, then doubt about God being good and reliable has to creep into your, into your heart based on what you see and hear. Okay? And, and, and so what, what amazes us about Abraham, uh, about Abraham's faith is that once he's convinced once with a real bona fide miracle, he never needed another miracle from that point on. Okay? But nobody else in the Bible is like that. Okay? They all need repeated miracles as, as a, again, this booster shot to, to re-remember that God is real, God is good, God is with them, God is trustworthy and God will come through for them. Okay? Uh, and we've seen in the past, as we see here with Gideon, that God... You know, maybe he's upset by this, but he but, but he understands this. Okay, he, he accommodates this rational doubtfulness in Abraham and Jacob and Moses and the Israelites. Um, he takes advantage of it in his chess match with 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 uh, with Pharaoh. Okay, so he expects this doubtfulness of the human mind, which he comes to understand. Maybe when he created us, maybe just over time. Um, 
But in any case, so, so I, I don't think it should surprise us that God isn't angry with Gideon for being doubtful, or that God doesn't smite him for being doubtful. Okay? Instead, God says, I'll show you with miracles, just as they did for Abraham and Jacob and Moses. Okay? I'll show you with miracles that I haven't abandoned you. I'm still here in your corner, still true to my promise to Abraham. Okay? I'm a man of my word. Um, and then, as you said, we get this Moses routine from Gideon in uh, verses 15 to wherever, 15, 24, 23, yeah, 22. Okay. Um, so, so, so like Moses, Gideon starts with, you know, how, uh, how will I, you know, the youngest son of a small family, not a leader of a powerful clan, how will I save the Israelites? And God says, don't worry, I'll be with you so you'll defeat them. And then Gideon asks for a miracle to prove, you know, to, to, you know prove to me that you're really God, rather than just some, some dude claiming to be the angel of God. Which he, which he again gets with the with, with, with the rock and the the soup etc. See this with yep, the fire? Yeah. Twenty one and tw twenty one. Yeah. Um, now is is this sacrilegious? Asking proof that this is a real angel of God? Doesn't seem to be based on um, what we've seen before. Right. Right. It always it, it, it happens often, and it happens because again we have to disassociate the angels that we have in mind from the angels in the Bible. The angel is a man. Okay, angels in the Bible are not winged fairies. Okay, uh, and and I'm sure we talked about this that when God sends an angel, that, that God sends angels and people send send angels. Angel in the Bible means messenger, not, not a celestial being. Okay. Um, so uh, actually, Gideon send, sends angels. If you, if you look at um, in this chapter, and when he sends messenger in... Thirty, thirty-five. Yeah. Yeah, and he sent messengers throughout Manasseh. Okay, you see, in Hebrew it says he sent angels. Okay, so your translator understands that because he's talking to people who have a certain understanding of the word angel, he, he doesn't use the word angel here because it's not a celestial. Gideon's angel is a man. Okay, by contrast... When um, in verse twenty-one, I'm sure your translator used the word angel in English, yep. right? Yeah. Okay. So your your translator is actually um, handicapping you because he's presenting Gideon as more doubtful than you need to see him. Gideon sees a man, but when you read your English text. You have the, the, the image that comes to mind for you because you happen to live in our world, you know, with you know, 2,000 years of Christian and, and Jewish uh, theology or religious development in between. Your image is of Gideon, a man, speaking to some sort of translucent uh, winged being who's clearly a celestial being. Okay, and so you're, you're, you're upset with Gideon for being so doubtful and, and demanding proof to me who you are. Okay? So, uh, so these messengers that God sends are either real people or some sort of avatar of God, but they certainly look like real people, as we saw in the Abraham story, okay, the, 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 the three guests, or with the angel who fought against Jacob. Okay? Jacob saw him as a man. 
and we thought of him as a man. Only at the end do we find out that he's a messenger from God. Um, and, and again, we'll come across this again in, with, with Samson's mother, who talks to an angel of God. So, um, so the point is, if Gideon is going to be receptive to the message here, if, if Gideon is going to do something so insane as leading his family to war against the mighty Midianites, the least he can do, uh, or at least he should do, is to verify that this really is a messenger of God rather than, um, than some crazy person who says he's God. Okay. And when he gets the miracle, he believes. Okay. He gets the miracle, he builds a... a, 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 a uh, gosh, what's the, what's the ring of shirt? What do you sacrifice things on? Altar. Altar, thank you. Uh, he builds an altar. Uh, he destroys his family's uh, pagan temple. And, and he starts recruiting soldiers from his family and then calls other tribes to join for war, etc. Okay. Um, so, so it works. But then, again, doubt, fear. I guess it's the same thing, right? Lack of faith in God is, is fear. Um, <clears throat> Gideon then starts feeling trepidation, expresses trepidation, and so he asks God for another miracle. We're now at, in verse uh, 36 to 38. 36, where is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, order to, in order to be sure you know, so we're now, we're really going to go to war. I want to make sure that God really is with us in this coming war. And God accommodates him. And then God, and, and then, sorry, Gideon, is still unsure that, you know, is this really a miracle from God? Is, 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 is God really God? So again, he puts God to the test again, demanding another miracle. This is in 3940. And again, God accommodates him. Okay, so, so again, God is not surprised by this, and God thinks it's perfectly understandable for people to demand miracle, uh, m miracles to, to trust that, that, that he's, he is who he is. Um, but many, many commentators, and, and I mentioned this before about Gideon being this kind of, it's inappropriate that he has to be prodded and cajoled and, and forced to, to, to stand up and do his job. So many commentators criticize Gideon for uh, as, 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 as lacking faith and being a worrywart and being a bit of a chicken. Okay, and I, I was wondering if, if, if you do see a point here. You know, because he, he is, um, you can see he's afraid of his family when he destroys the pagan temple. He destroys it at night because he's afraid of his family's wrath. Uh, and he's afraid to go to war. And he, you know, are you really God? Are you really God? And, 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 and even then, even after the second miracle, um, he's still afraid. So he has to creep down to the enemy camp. You know, God tells him, if you're still afraid, go down to the en en enemy camp and, and you'll hear something or you'll see something. Okay, and only when he hears that conversation does he see it as a sign from God that God's with us and, and, and he does something. So, so do you think this image that we have actually is... Uh, warranted of, of of a bit of a chicken, a bit of a worrywart, lacking in faith. It doesn't seem to doesn't seem so to me just because <clears throat> what he's being asked to do is so crazy. <laughs> like in like in his everyday life, and he's had nothing before this to indicate otherwise. Right, right. he's not. This is the way the world works, and the way the world works. If I do this, I'm going to get killed. Yeah. Yeah. And not only am I going to get killed, I'm, uh, I'm going to get all these people killed. Right. Yeah. So, uh, look, th th there's no doubt that Gideon is presented as afraid. You know, more, so, more than Barak, certainly. Um, but on the other hand, you know, he's asked to do these crazy things, and he does them. Okay, he, uh, he does do these difficult things. He takes the plunge 
despite knowing that his family will be angry at him for destroying their temple, their altar. Um, and he goes to war despite knowing, you know, he knows how to count. He's going to war with 300 people against how many? 10,000? However many, I forget how many. Um, he knows he's vastly outnumbered. Okay, so, so he, we can understand it as, as many commentators do, as a mark against him for not having faith if, uh, his fear is a symptom of not having faith, of, of, you know, of being a man of little faith. B but you can take the same story, same words, same sentences, and see a man who overcomes his very rational fears because he does believe. Okay? He, he believes thanks to the miracles and the signs. But that's true of everyone, even Abraham believes because of miracles and signs. And when he believes, he does these insane things. Okay? Because he does trust, uh, trust that God will come through. Okay? So, so he's, he's actually brave and a man of, of deep faith, according to the standard that we have from previous acts of faith. Moses, Abraham, Jacob, etc. Okay? Um, and you, again, if you go back to, to the other, to, to Barak, same thing. Barak was afraid to go to battle without Deborah, okay, without the woman of God being physically in his camp. Okay? But when he does, he goes ahead and goes into a battle that he knows he should lose if God were not with him. Okay? So, so it is a... You do see faith here. Uh, and, and, and I guess you'll see the same thing with uh, Yiftach. Okay, he's afraid of this upcoming war, which is why he makes this special vow uh, to God, which he wind up, you know, you know, being being. Uh, and we'll, we'll discuss about it. We'll discuss whether this is indeed the case about vowing to sacrifice his daughter. Um, so it's something to that this these fearful leaders that are presented as fearful because they're lacking in faith, it's something to keep in mind when we get to, to Samson because Samson really is fearless. Okay, so these guys conquer their fear, okay, which is perfectly acceptable you know, it, 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 or consistent with our understanding of brave and, and whatever other words we... Uh, and, and, and having faith. Okay, they're afraid that they're doing something insane, but they have faith that God will provide, and therefore they get over their fear. Samson is different because Samson never overcomes his fear, and never overcomes fear because he never has fear. He's truly fearless. Um, so I think a, a more appropriate critique um, of, of, of Gideon, or a more, important, more, more appropriate question, rather than the accusation of him being chicken or, or faithless, faithless, is why the original miracle wasn't enough to convince Gideon to, uh, to destroy his father's uh, pagan uh, temple, incurring his family's wrath, and to call up troops uh, and, 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 and go forth to battle. Okay, wh why is... Um, why is it that he was convinced enough to do what he, he did to his family and to call up troops, but all of a sudden it's not enough to actual to, to, to... Why is he again unsure on the eve of battle? I suppose the last time he, already saw took the, he, he already believed enough to, right. call, to call the men to arms and to alienate himself from his family, potentially. So the previous time we saw something like this is with Egypt, where they weren't impressed by things that they saw every day, which isn't the case here. He hadn't seen this every day, yeah. and it still wasn't enough, but it still wasn't, I don't know, uh, big enough, out of the ordinary enough? What was it? It was fire consuming the meat. Yeah. Basically, yeah, like some sort of 
uh, audio. It's kind of like Moses and the burning uh, bush. Whereas, and then they go uh, to just the fleece getting wet, and that's not enough. Yeah. And then no, 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 but, but, yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm asking why he needs the 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 the, the fleece miracles, okay? Because he he once he was convinced there with the angel, he goes ahead. He destroys the pagan altar. He calls people to war. Why does he get cold feet at that point that he needs the fleece miracles? It would seem to uh, be uh, questioning the scope of this God's power, I suppose. Yeah. Like strong enough to help with this family matter, but maybe not strong enough to go into war with another nation. or Yeah. And... Uh, that I'm not. I, I don't necessarily think so much the uh, the power of God. You know that you can protect me, but can you protect thousands of soldiers? But rather, the it's a different setting now. That, that now he's he's on the eve of sending thousands of his kinfolk on what seems like a suicide mission. And and if you if you remember how we started this with Gideon, you know that his his comment to the to the angel. Okay, that, that God, God used to come. You know, we know from our fathers and grandfathers stories that God used to come through for us way back in the day with miraculous victories and, 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 and wonders in the desert, etc. But he's abandoned us since then. He hasn't been around for forever, for generations. Okay, so God hasn't been here. Um, our Gideon knows, Gideon, Gideon told the, the angel, our neighbors have had their way with us because God disappeared on us. And so now, as he's about to send his friends and family and tribesmen to, to, to a suicidal war, God, I'm sorry, Gideon, it's understandable that he wants to re-verify with more miracles and wonders and then re-verify with a second fleece uh, miracle that God, God is still there. You know, God is still with the army because if not, then this really is just plainly a suicide mission. Okay, if, so given that I, like all the other Israelites, up until now, we thought that God left us, that God was done with us. I had this one miracle and now about to send thousands of people into war, I want to make sure that God didn't do another disappearing act. Okay? Because if, if God is not with us, so again, me destroying the temp, my, my family's temple, bad enough if God isn't, if the angel isn't really an angel of God. Uh, but if I'm leading my people into war and God is not with us, then I'm simply a false prophet leading my people into a trap, into destruction. To, to destruction. Okay. So, so I think that explains why he needs, why he asks at the, on the eve of battle for the fleece miracles. But, but then the question is, okay, why does he need the second miracle? If he got, if he got a fleece, if, if the fleece miracle, if the first, if the first fleece miracle uh, was, wh why wasn't it enough to convince him? That, that God is really God and that God is still with us. In the first one, it was just the fleece that got wet. In the second one, everything got wet except the fleece. So it seems like it's a bigger... It seems like the first one would... If somebody spilled some water on it or something. Well, I, I, I'll ask you, look, if, if you're in that situation and, 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 and you ask for a miracle... Yeah, why would you And, ask and, and you ask, make this fleece wet by morning and and it became wet and everything around was not wet would you want a second miracle would, would, would that be enough to convince you that god did this was my yeah it probably would be enough I'm trying to think just because i came up why did he come up with this particular thing. That uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're right as to why, why did he come up with this idiotic miracle? Okay, but it's, it's an idiotic miracle. Yeah, when you live, if look, on you know, maybe not in the winter, 
but in the spring and summer and fall, I guarantee if I leave a piece of wool on the ground, most mornings that piece of wool will be wet. Okay, so if, and not on the grass, if you put it on cement, okay, the, uh, the dew on the ground, on the cement, will evaporate, but the dew in the, in the wool would, the, the, the wool would, would hold the moisture. Okay, so because wool naturally, naturally, by nature, naturally, uh, holds moisture better than open surfaces. Okay, so he asked for this exact miracle, but it's an idiotic miracle. It's an idiotic request. He asked poorly. Okay, he asked for a miracle that is not contrary to nature. Okay, and he fixes that problem, and this is why he's, conv he's not convinced by this, <laughs> this silly miracle. But the second miracle really is contrary to nature. Okay? The fleece, which holds moisture well, is bone dry, whereas the ground is wet. That's a miracle. Okay? Now he knows, at that, at that point he knows that God is real, because this is not natural. You know, this is not a voice in my head. I'm not imagining this. I'm not going to be a false prophet. I'm not sending my, my, my people to their deaths. Okay. Um, and, yet, and yet, going back to the fear factor, yet fear creeps back into, into his heart. Okay, and God tells him, if you need more, go down to the Midianite camp. <clears throat> um, and... and and, 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 and you'll find some. Actually, how, how does it... Where's my glasses? How does it translate to you when God tells him to go down? Uh, verse... Uh, this is chapter 7. Yeah, so, so, so in, in, in chapter 7, verse... Uh, <clears throat> in the early verses, he separates... He, God shaves down the number of the troops all the way down to 300. And then read chapter, read chapter nine, 9 and 10. I'm uh, sorry, verse yeah. 9 and 10. Uh, 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 9 to 11. Uh, that night the Lord said to him, Come, attack the camp, for I have delivered it into your hands. And if you are afraid to attack, first go down to the camp with your attendant uh, Purah, and listen to what they say. After that, you will have the courage to attack the camp. Okay. So he went down with his attendant. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's exactly uh, true to the original. So, um, so why at this point does he need to hear the Midianites' dream to trust that God is with him? Still so scary. I mean, what, 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 again, putting you back into that position, why, why would you, in that position, why would you still have fear in your heart before that battle, even after the, the do miracle? It would have to be the, because your number, you're just looking at the numbers in this seemingly impossible task where the miracle is going to be if you win. <laughs> yeah. No, look, and that's definitely... Um, It's definitely it, it's definitely true that um, that Gideon Gideon is racked by fear and doubt all the time, all the time, all the time, until the moment of victory. Okay, the the, the instant before the battle is the last time Gideon ever expresses fear or doubt. Okay, once he actually defeats a hundred thousand Midianites with three hundred people. He no longer shows doubt in God or fear of war or anything. Because this, the victory itself, is a bona fide and incontrovertible, incontrovertible uh, miracle. Okay? Just like the birth of Isaac. That, that, that cannot be natural. Just like uh, the 10th plague for Pharaoh. Pharaoh can, can see a possibility that the, the, all the, the previous nine, some sort of 
natural phenomenon, some sort of wacky natural phenomenon. Okay, but not the tenth plague. Okay. Um, and and if you and if you take a look at again chapter seven uh, verses two and uh, two two to four, when when God starts um, kind of um, shaving down the number of troops, uh, you can see that the text tells us that this exactly was God's intention in shaving down the army from thirty thousand to only ten thousand, and then from ten thousand to only three hundred. Okay, so again, if you look at these, at these uh, verses, you can see that it's not so much to prove to Gideon himself that God is faithful to Israel, but to prove to any doubtful Israelite, including Gideon, that this is the case. If, if you can defeat 100,000 Midianites with 300 men, this is clearly not you. This is clearly a sign that God is still with you. It's not some, you know, stories that your grandfathers told you. Okay, again, remember what, what, what Gideon told the, the angel. Okay, that this is true in the past, but God, God's left us. Okay. Um, in any case, but, but going back to the question, what, what, so why wouldn't the, what, why would you want, what, why is the second fleece miracle, even though it's convincing, why in the moment of truth is it not convincing? And again, we, we've seen, I, I, I think we've, I think you and I both were, were, were absolving Gideon from the um, accusation of being faithless. You know, he's clearly doing things, conquering his fear, doing things uh, because he believes, okay? comes to believe based on miracles, which is not a crime. Everyone does it based on miracles. But why is, but why is the second miracle at the moment of truth not enough? That, 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 that he needs that to, to go down. And, and God knows it. You know, God says, if you're still afraid, go down to the camp. Why is he still afraid and he goes down to the camp? The, the second fleece miracle wasn't quite as in... You could rationalize it somehow. Was it in contra? Um, again, um, if if you were in that position, because look, you're right that the the stakes are really high. I'm about to take three hundred men to fight ten thousand, uh, a hundred thousand soldiers. So you're right, the stakes are really high. But do you design a miracle that seems contrary to nature, and it came true? So what, 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 look, I know that you would also have doubt, okay? I'm just asking you, why would you have doubt after that miracle? It's like, it's like the moment of truth. Yeah, but, but, but look, uh, as we just said, uh, this victory convinces Gideon never to doubt again. This is bona fide. Okay? Why isn't the miracle that you yourself designed with the fleece, the second one, why is, it why is there still some corner in your mind that is doubtful that this really is, cause, cause look, that, that, that this is proof of God? Cause look, I, I know it would be for me and I'm assuming for you. So why would it be? It seems, seems to satis should satisfy but it doesn't. Am I am I right that that, that yeah. you would still doubt? Yeah. It would still be uh You could explain the second thing with natural. I, I just think of different ways in which it could be explained. I, I, exactly. Causes. Exactly. Look, it, it's just like we saw with Pharaoh. Look, it's it seems by all account to be a miracle, but it's due. Okay, look, I'm not a physicist. Okay, and 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 just like we have Pharaoh, had to admit 
This really is a crazy eclipse. I've never seen or heard of an eclipse like this. But I've heard of it and I've seen eclipses. This is crazy hail, but I've seen hail. Crazy locust. We've had attacks of locust. Okay, so these, the, these are all known phenomena. Okay, so, so it's, this is just, this eclipse really is crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Okay, but it's not, like, if you blew up the sun, that really is something that, th there's nothing like it. Okay, but a long eclipse is just a long eclipse. Okay, uh, and the same with all the others, except for the tenth uh, plague. Okay, so this, this, the, the, the thing here with the uh, with the second um, fleece miracle, it seems like it, but the stakes are so high, and I don't know, I don't know for sure that this is not a natural phenomenon. Okay, and, 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 and so, again, fear. But, again, once again, as always, he conquers his fear and goes ahead. Um, but, <clears throat> um, when, when, when God shaves down the, the size of the army and, and, and says why he's doing it in, in, in verses 2 to 4, uh, he's doing it so that no one, no Israelite, will, will be able to doubt that this victory, the salvation from their enemies, is an act of God. Okay? Um, no one will, he, he, he wants no one to be able to claim that this is an explainable military victory. It has to be a true miracle. Just like the miracles that you heard from your fathers and your grandfathers about what God did for us many, many, many years ago. You think that it's just part of history. It's happening here now. You are experiencing this. Okay, this is not some, the, 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 this is God's assistance not to Moses or Joshua or who generations ago. It's happening to you now. God is coming uh, to save us isn't a bunch of tall tales, okay, stories your grandmother told you uh, about ancient history. It's a real thing today in the present. Okay? So, going back to that discrepancy between what the prophet tells the people and what Gideon tells the angel, don't think that God abandoned you. So don't abandon God. Don't go back to your idols, etc., etc. Don't, don't worship these Canaanite gods. Don't be afraid. Have faith and stick to your God rather than thinking that God has moved on with his life and, and, and moved to these other gods. Okay. So this was God's purpose, as he himself says. Um, does it work? Yeah, did... did did, it, did this victory prove to the Israelites that, that God saved them miraculously rather than them defeating the enemy with their own strength? It doesn't last. Why do you say this? Because they uh, quickly f fall back into this pattern of abandoning God and... Where? Where do you see it? No. Oh, specifically? Yeah. No, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking generations later. Yeah. Oh. Th these Israelites who just won this battle, do they attribute their victory to, to God miraculously? Look, the answer is no. Right. <laughs> it, it, right. God is not successful in convincing them. Okay, but, but, but where does the text tells you, tell you this? Hey, the, the, the Israelites say in their own words when they speak to Gideon, why, why, why do the uh, Israelites ask Gideon to be their king? Because they're scared. And, um, right, no, but... but and he's uh, apparently... Oh, they attributed his 
the victory to his military expertise. Right, you see, in, in, this is uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 22. Okay, after Israel he... said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson as well, for you have saved us from the Midian. For you have saved us from Midian. Okay. Rule us, you, your son, your son's sons, because you saved us from, from, from uh, Midian. They don't see this as God's doing, but as Gideon's doing, the general's doing. Okay. And uh, by the way, some, some commentators point out, correctly it seems, that Gideon doesn't correct them. Okay, the next verse doesn't say, what, are you crazy? It doesn't mean it was God. Okay, there's silence. Um, so, okay, so, so, uh, so, so when, when he says, I shall not rule you, Okay, he says, I shall not rule you, my son shall not rule you, God shall rule you. But he doesn't say, because God, he doesn't explain why this is so. Look, if I saved you, then I should be your, your, your ruler, I'll protect you further. But if God saved you, God should be your king, because he will protect you further. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but, but perhaps, certainly it doesn't say that he corrected the history, that the, you know, gave credit to who credit to, to, to the person who deserves it. Um, you know, so maybe it's reading too much into Gideon's silence, but, but maybe Gideon's response is, maybe it is half-hearted half and reveals something about his view of himself in the war. Again, I, I don't know. And, and on the one hand, there is silence. On the other hand, maybe we shouldn't read too much into it. Um, but in this respect, I, uh, I asked you whether, you whether you notice changes in Gideon over the course of his story. Um, and I'm assuming you can, you can probably tell by the question that I think he does change. Uh, so if, if, if you think he changes, if, if you see changes in him. It would seem that um, you pointed out that uh, he no longer has that fear that he had, or he kept on uh, questioning. He seems more confident, I suppose. Where, where, you're right. Where, where do you see it? Well, even in what we, you could even read what we just read is a little bit of that. Right. When, uh, he doesn't nay say that he was had some kind of, he was somehow responsible for their victory. Right. But where? I mean, so if if. If, there's, if, if we identify him as timid and humble and fearful, well, I guess timid, before the war, but aggressive and cocksure and kingly after the war, um, where, where do you see this in his, in his action? Like, like, what, what can you point to to see? This, this is a different kind of leader. This is no longer that humble, timid, fearful leader who is kind of forcing her, himself to do stuff but rather he's just aggressive and, and confident. He took those things from the people and then he made an effort of gold and then he set up his own town. Right, yeah, but, he, but even beforehand. Uh, you, you're right about that. But after the war, do you see in, uh, in, in the... Da, 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 da. I have a request to make of each of you. Give me earring. I received booty. They had yeah. For their no, no, but, but 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 that's after this after this uh, scene, okay? But after the war uh, with with uh, Midian, oh. in chapter eight, you know, when, when the people of Ephraim confront him, and then the people of the, the the towns of Sukkot and Penuel don't feed his men. Do you remember that episode? Yeah. So he didn't ask for another sign. Oh yeah, no, no. Now he, he, he doesn't need God's support or so, yeah, know, just... faith in God that God will help him out in his war against the people of Ephraim and the people of uh, Sukkot and the people of Penuel. Okay? When the people of Sukkot and Penuel don't feed his men, he acts as a king facing rebellion. Okay? Um, when, so, so during the war, he is conciliatory 
towards the people of Ephraim. He, he appeases them. He kind of quiets them down and he um, accommodates them when, when, when they ex express anger. But after the war, after he wins, when, when the people of Sukkot and Tuel don't feed his men, he treats them as rebels. Okay? And he tells them that he's punishing them for dishonoring him. Where is it? Uh, verses, uh, verses 5, 6. Okay, he's... I'm trying to see where, where he comes back to them. Where he says, when I come back, I'll do this and this. And he goes up. Okay, so here, 15. He comes back to them. See, uh, you uh, shamed me, or uh, what, what's the word it has for you? Um, you? You have done what to me? Uh, so in 15, I have, then he came to the people of Sukkot and said, here are Zeba and uh, Zalmuna. Th these are the uh, Midian Umimai. generals that he, that he captured. Saying, are Zeba and Zumuna already yeah. in no, no, your no, but, hands? But, but, but what, what, what did they, did they curse him, or, or what, what does it say he, they did to him? about whom you mocked me. Oh, mocked, okay, mocked. Um, and he punishes them and kills the people of the town. Okay, but again, he says, you, you, you've shamed me or you've mocked me or cursed me. He clarifies that he's punishing them for dishonoring him, not because they failed to support the national war effort or something like that. It's a personal affront. And then, the same thing, he goes to these uh, Midianite generals to Zevach and, and uh, Tzalmona and tells them da -da, verse 18 okay this is after he kills the people uh, of, uh, of, of, of Penuel he goes to these Midianite generals and um, and asks them or, I'm sorry he tells them that the people they killed at at the Tavor mountain were my brothers and then he clarifies to us the audience that these are not his figurative brothers okay, the people of Israel or his kinsmen or something like that fellow Israelites but literally his brothers the sons of my mother is that how it's written for you? no oh, how is it written this, for you? this is this. verse uh, nine, uh, yeah 19 Oh no! They do so in nineteen. They say that they were my brothers. He declared the sons of my mother. Yeah. He, okay. He does say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he says, "Had you let them live again, verse nineteen, had you not killed them, then I would not kill you." Okay. So, uh, so, so look, the the Bible bother the the author bothers to tell us both of these full dialogues with the people of Sukkot and Penuel, and with Zevach and Salmona, to, to show us how, how he sees his victory, or, or how he sees himself in this victory. Okay. His conversations with them reflect, uh, show a man who is leading a personal campaign. Okay, this is no longer a war of national, uh, it's no longer a national vendetta or a national war, but a personal vendetta. Okay, and, and, and I'm assuming that the Bible shows us the full dialogue because, look, it's not that important. But the, the, the author wants us to see this dialogue, to see this transformation. Okay, he, he's avenging himself on the people who killed his brothers and avenging himself on the people who denied him food rather than hurt the war effort. Okay, so he, he, he becomes forceful, he flexes his muscle, muscle uh, and, and punishes the people who stood in his way or harmed him personally. And, and we're not the only ones who see it. Okay? His people saw it too, the people back then. Which is why after the sacking of Sukkot and Penuel, his tribe, or maybe a, b a bunch of tribes, 
offer him a, a royal crown. Okay, so he, he rejects the crown. I will not rule you. My son won't rule you. God will rule, will rule you. However, it does t tell us, the author does tell us, that he taxed them. He took their gold to manufacture this golden ephod, which is some sort of fancy regalia, some sort of priestly or, or kingly um, piece of, of, of clothing of some sort, something that you wear. Uh, and he puts it on display in his own hometown, okay, rather than in Bethel or Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant sat. Okay. And the text in, in 827, uh, in, in, in Hebrew, uh, so I don't know how it's translated in English, uh, so uh, Gideon uh, made this ephod and put it on display in his, in his town of Ophrah, and the people in, in all of Israel hoard after it. And it became a um, uh, kind of a, 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 a problem, or actually, how how is it uh, translated for you? And it became what? A, a snare. A snare. Okay, for his for his for his family, for 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 him and his family. And how about the word that I have as as hoard after? It said uh, went astray after. Yeah. So um, the. The, the, the word hoard after is often used when, when, when the Israelites are described as going after or, or following, worshiping foreign gods. And so this, this might be a hint uh, of some sort of personal worship associated with this ephod. Okay, maybe pagan worship even, because the story is kind of reminiscent of, the, of Aaron and the golden calf. Again, asking the people to donate their jewelry, melting the gold, forming the gold, the, molten, the melted gold into some sort of object of, of reverence or, or worship. Um, so, so again, so maybe some sort of personal worship or, or, or pagan worship. Um, so, so either way, even without the pagan stuff, we see Gideon adopting a kingly manner in his dealings with Sukkot and Penuel and Zevach and Salmona and afterwards with his people. And if we don't see it, if we don't see uh, Gideon adopting a more kingly manner, then the biblical author rubs our nose in it, you know, and, and spells it out for us even more explicitly, um, that, that, you know, showing us that Gideon acts like a king by telling us he had many, many wives and concubines. He names his son Avimelech which means in Hebrew, the son of a king. Avi is my father, Melech, king. Okay? He has many wives, concubines. He names his son, basically prince, uh, or crown prince. Um, and, and indeed, this same boy, Avi Melech, does rule as a king after Gideon. Okay, so if we didn't, with this effort and everything else and the taxing, if we didn't kind of smell the, kind of get a whiff of monarchy, the author is telling us, if you had this sense, if you had this whiff, it's with good reason. Wives, concubines, his son's name, and his, son's, his son following him as a her hereditary ruler. Okay, so, so we saw a declaration of intent from Gideon, which was no doubt sincere. Okay? I shall not rule you, my son shall not rule you, God shall rule you. But then we have a record of behavior that is the opposite of that declaration of principle. He does rule them, his son does rule them, and they, st they stray away from, from worshiping God. Okay, so. So why is this happening? Why would a fellow like Gideon, who you know, whom we all knew as a devout man of good character and humility, why would he change this way? You know, why did power go to his head? 
wasn't that part of the concern with Moses too and his apotheosis like just with human beings power corrupts yeah yeah look it, we'll, we'll we'll see the same story with with uh, Saul good humble etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah look the, the the Bible believes that human beings stink God found this out um, in, in the Adam story in the Cain story in the Lemech story in the Noah story and he said so that I now know that man's heart or the 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 was it the the impulse of man's heart or the, the whatever uh, is evil from its youth okay? that's what the Bible believes human nature stinks therefore if you give a human being power even a clearly good man like Gideon or like Saul you will wind up with abusive power. Um, look, we, we, we don't have that much time to discuss uh, the Avimelech story, but the, the post-war part of the Gideon story, so look, the, the, the Avimelech story is clearly a rebuke of monarchy, obviously, um, and, and Yotam's parable about monarchy. But the, the post-war part of Gideon's life is also a biblical criticism of, of monarchy, followed by the Avimero story, which is even more explicit in its critique or rejection of monarchy. And Yotam's parable about the trees uh, puts that criticism in. So basically, you have a criticism of monarchy in the form of a story, then a critique of monarchy in the form of kind of the, the, the this of a, of a history of look at this evil king and then in the form of a of a play and not, not play of a poem okay and in the next book in the book of Samuel Samuel um, will, will, will continue this with again the same message in the form of an exhortation like a a lecture okay so you have a story then a history, then a poem, and then in Samuel, like a philosophy, a political science lecture. Okay, explaining to the Israelites why they should not create a monarchy. Which, of course, he'll fail to do, but, uh, but, but he again offers us, the readers, a strident rejection of monarchy as a political model. Okay? So, so why is this book so this book, the next book, why are they so anti-monarchical? Why do they hate? Why does the Bible disapprove of monarchy? It seems uh, a continuing theme that this kind of power corrupts, or that um, there's. Yeah, so, um, yeah. but, but, but why do these people uh, believe this? You know, w w I mean, look, monarchy was the normal go-to form of, 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 of governance in the, in the ancient world and in their part of the ancient world. Why are they so out of the mainstream in that respect? What, what, what's unique about the Israelites that make them reject this model that all the other peoples in their region accept and embrace? I'm, I'm sorry, no, it's not that the Israelites reject it. The Israelites will adopt it as well. But, but there's this clear message that this is a bad thing. Why do they think it's bad but other peoples think it's good or appropriate? I want to say it has to do with the pagan paganism um to do with israel's boundaries are set they're not expansive they're not imperial yeah but uh, but, 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 but but a king can a king can rule look the king of jordan the king of saudi arabia today 
you know, they've, they've ruled their kingdoms. They haven't launched wars of expansion, I think, ever. I mean, Jordan did, but, but not Saudi Arabia. Actually, yeah, Jordan did. So, look, a, a king can be an expansionist or, or non-expansionist. Just like, it, just like a, you know, a, a republic can. Look, Nazi Germany, very expansive. Denmark, not expansive. Expansionist, sorry. Is that a king? A king is always going to do what's in what the king sees in, is in his interest. Not uh, isn't subordinate necessarily to a god. Yeah. So uh, certainly, Pharaoh the, is uh, a god. Yeah, yeah, but um, look, th theologically, look, we're talking about, again, uh, the, the Bible doesn't have a problem with an Egyptian king ruling Egypt or a Moabite king ruling Mo I don't think they, yeah, they did, um, or, or, or an Assyrian king ruling Assyria. It only is concerned with the Israelites because the Israelites are God's people. Um, so theologically, as you said, the, the, the Bible believes, which, which as God, as, as sorry, as Gideon, uh, explicitly says here, you know, Gideon is delivering the message of the Bible that, and, and, and Samuel will deliver it again, that a human king competes with God as the ruler of the Jews. Okay? Uh, you know, the, 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 the Jews are ruled by God. And if there's a human king, then now there's a competition. You know, who, the, 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 you have two rulers, basically. Um, but also, and, and, and that's why in, in, in Deuteronomy, there's this, again, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to Samuel, but there's this instruction that if you get a king, that king has to study, has to write the Torah under the supervision of priests and Levites and make sure that he is subordinate to the law, subordinate to God's law, to establish that this king is not a real king. He's subordinate, uh, he's, he's subject to the law rather than making law. Um, so so that's, that's one. And, and also, again, theologically, the Bible holds, that, again, that the impulse of, of man's heart is evil from its youth. And therefore, people will misuse their power when they're given power. And monarchy, of course, is the most concentrated form of political power. Okay? So first... Monarchy is an affront to God. And second, it produces abuse of power and tyranny for, for the people. Okay? Um, but, but, but again, the, 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 the question still stands, why is it only this Israelite book? You know, why only the Bible among all the ancient books or all the ancient um, you know, pieces of, of, of ancient peoples that is so opposed or so suspicious of monarchy. Um. Like, what would make the Israelites so uncomfortable with it in a way that others are not? Or this Israelite book, Israelite leaders, Israelite priests, or, or whatever their history from Egypt I'm trying to think um, yeah, but look uh, uh, other people I'm sure were oppressed by by, form, by by other countries ruled by kings naturally like the Israelites are not the only ones who were enslaved not the only ones who were conquered by some foreign kingdom I guess if this is written post exile, then it's this group of people's different insofar as they don't have a homeland anymore and they're still a group. Right. Um, meaning I mean, that. Yeah, th th that's my sense of it. So, so wh wh why is it, like, what is it about these people who don't have a home uh, that would make them. Look, um, Again, looking at this region today, 
Saudi Arabia has a king. Jordan has a king. Um, Iraq had a king. Iran had a king. Egypt had kings. Okay, but the only people who live in this area again, this is before the before the Jews came back and and reclaimed uh, the state of the, the the land of Israel, the only people who lived in this area who didn't have a king, the the, the, the Ottomans had a king, like a, a sultan king. Um, but the only people who peoples people uh, who lived in this area who did not have a king were the Bedouins. Okay, they have this tribal structure with elders. Okay, and then the elders of the tribe govern the tribe. Okay, each clan governs itself. Okay? That, and that, that, that's how the the Israelite tribes were. You know that that's how they were organized when they came from the desert to settle in their tribal settlements in the land of Israel. And this is true whether you are following the text itself that tells you they were in the desert for a generation, coming from Egypt to the land of Israel, or if you're looking at it through archaeology or anthropology and seeing them as these peoples, these nomadic shepherding people who lived in the desert, or on the edges of Canaanite society, but again, these migratory, a migratory population that then became settled. Okay, so whether you're taking the kind of historical understanding of, uh, of the Israelites' formation or the biblical one, or the, the textual one, they had this tribal, this Bedouin structure. Okay, so the question is, why don't the Bedouins have a king? Yeah, wh wh why do the Saudis have a king, and the Jordanians, and the Iraqis, and the Egyptians, but not the Bedouins? Bedouins don't have like a, a like a they're migratory. Right. More. So so what? They don't have this like a settled. They don't have a settlement. Right. But, settled. But, yes, but but why why do um, again if you look at at, at these Arab populations. Why did settled Arabs, Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, etc., why did settled Arabs establish monarchies? So, look, the, the, uh, a king competes with the elders. Okay? They, they, they all, you know, they all have a history of, of, of a tribal history. Okay? When you elevate a king, you demote the elders of the tribe, okay? the, the aristocracy. Same thing. Same thing we see in Europe. A strong king demotes the aristocracy. A strong aristocracy demotes the king, okay, or takes power from the king. Um, so, uh, so, so why did settled Arabs do this, establish monarchy and, and demote the elders of the tribes? And why did uh, Bedouins not do this? Like, wh wh what does settlement matter? Do you see what I mean? I want to say it has to do with something about uh, securing a, a settlement. Um, like, look, you're milk. absolutely right. And, and this is, you know, obviously we're not talking about the Bible here, we're talking about anthropology, but wh why does a settlement, why is a settlement in greater need of protection than a migratory tribe that's hurting? Um, because they can't retreat. Like a settlement is stuck where it is, um, unless they do like an Athenian take to the sea kind of thing. But that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, no, but but uh, you're right. But that, that's um, look. You're obviously right tactically, okay. But 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 also look. A, a set, uh, when an unsettled people settle and become agricultural. Um, they need more protection because agriculture produces an unprecedented level of wealth. Okay, it's a target. Okay, it's like putting a pot of gold. Look, when when, when you're just uh, living some sort of subsistence economy, when when let's say you're settled, okay, but you can barely uh, feed yourself and your wife. Marauders are not coming to take what's yours. You barely have anything. 
but if you put a pot of gold and advertise it gold here marauders are going to come okay so uh, anthropologically speaking and historically speaking the birth of agriculture and permanent settlement produced wealth produced greater sustenance and thereby required stronger and more f uh, formal institutional gov institutions of government because now you, you basically put a target on your back you need protection and for that you need stronger forms of government more formal institutional government okay and we see the same thing in the Israelites okay the biblical story tells us that they were wanderers who became settled uh, a settled people the anthropological evidence suggests likewise that they formed as a people in the desert south of Canaan as wanderers and, and herders and then they settled portions of Canaan okay. but even even as they transitioned from migration and herding to settlement and farming their culture their mores their values were still the culture of uh, of the desert you know the culture of a desert of, of, of Bedouins of the de of a desert civilization of a, of a migratory herding culture okay. when <clears throat> um, when when we read the book of Joshua um, you, you you see <clears throat> sorry actually I think I, I think I emailed I think I emailed you about the pro herding bias that the Bible has hmm? right yeah um, so look the Bible likes shepherds it, it, it tells stories about shepherds versus farmers or shepherds versus cities okay from you know Abel the shepherd to Moses the shepherd okay and it views urban life and permanent settlement with with apprehension you know as, as, as a as a civilization a form of living that is more easily susceptible to wealth corruption vice etc so uh, so settling down made the Israelites more productive which made them a target for their powerful neighbors who as you've read attacked them and taxed them and plundered them and so the Israelites respond to this oppression coming from all sides by appointing military chieftains these judges to protect them okay and they want the strong chieftain Gideon in this case to be their king okay they, they, they want the successful protector the successful judge Gideon Saul David to be a permanent protector to be a permanent savior okay? to, to be strong enough to protect us from our enemies not just today like Ehud but also tomorrow and the next day and the next day. because look the, the, the book of Judges tells you look the judge did his job the land was at peace for a while but then the marauders came back so we need somebody who's going to be there always you know to always you know to, to, to do what Ehud did always do the job okay so so transitioning to settlement made them do what we know from anthropology you know agriculture settlement creates stronger more formal institutions of government these elders become chieftains judge, and chieftains become kings but the culture again their mores their their values are still desert values okay their, their, their values are, are the uh, tribal herding values that they had pa practiced for generations in the desert okay, their, their circumstances changed their wealth increased their insecurity therefore increased but their values were formed in the desert and that includes the attitude towards the, the attitude of Bedouins towards towards monarchy okay so their, their, their lifestyle and their life demanded a stronger protector a strong protector but their ancient tribal code of, of values 
you know, and, and their desert theology viewed monarchy with fear and disdain. Okay, and, and, and you can see this, I think, from, from your own life in America. Okay? The American population is an urban population. Yeah, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but I think like 2% of Americans or something crazy like that work the land, you know, or, or agricultural. Okay? But American history is completely agricultural. Okay? Only 20 years ago, uh, 20, uh, 200 years ago, 90-something percent of Americans worked in farming, you know, worked the land. Okay? So in, in, in the 200 years, we've gone from, let's say, 98% or 95% working the land to 2% or 3% working the land. Uh, our circumstances have completely changed. Our, the, the way we live is completely different, but, but our values are still predominantly rural and pastoral, even though we don't live that life anymore. Do, do you see what I mean by this? Yeah, do, do you see American values? It would, uh, traditional and family values seem to be, yeah. come from that rural family farm kind of. Yeah. Look, we, we, we bring, we live city lives, but we bring, to this urban setting, an older value system from the farm. A gun culture, a country aesthetic. Look, uh, American homes have this kind of heavy wood aesthetic that's, it, it's a country aesthetic. Okay? It's, and it's, not, it's certainly not urbane. The, the more urbane homes have th kind of thinner, sleeker furniture, but that's not the American furniture aesthetic. Um, this attachment to land and to privacy, which again, it's from the farm. Um, uh, you know, maybe even taste in music. Our understanding of masculine and feminine virtues or feminine roles. These are all things that are, have their, their uh, you know, th th that we brought from the country to our urban dwellings. You know, so these are things that you, you don't shed your, your, your values, your culture, your kind of civilization co civil, civilizational code by, 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 transition, by, by changing your circumstances of living. I'm assuming it happens, there's a long lagging effect. I don't know how long. Okay. And the Israelites likewise, they left the desert behind. They left the wandering behind. They left the shepherding behind. But again, but that value system didn't just die when they moved to to to, to city life or to farm life. Okay, uh, and and their old value system from the desert included this notion that God is a king, and that people with power will abuse it. Okay, this again, this twin theological understanding of God being the king and therefore shouldn't have competitors, and this, again, this theological understanding of human nature, which was formed apparently in the desert, um, and, and, and how kings represent a danger to the people. Okay. So it's an affront to God and a danger to the people. Uh, all right, good. Um, anything else about uh, these, these judges before we turn next week to uh, Tiftach? No, not right now. All right, good. So look, I'll, I'll send you an email with the uh, reading and, and a, like this, some, some, some background about uh, Iftach and, and, and the Gilad. And uh, next week? Sounds good. Is there, any, is there any way next week we could uh, start at noon? Yeah. My my daughter's yes. got yes. something at th yes. at three thirty. That would the answer is yes. I don't even okay. care. About. <laughs> All right, noon next week. Okay. Sounds great. Excellent. Look See forward to it. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you. See you. Have a good week. You too.